Bandwidth provided by liquidweb.com. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and this is the SendGrid Startup of the Week. Yes, every week we cover a promising new startup, and this week it's Zing Checkout. And Zing Checkout is doing some awesome stuff in the POS space. Stick with us. You're going to hear all about it. Hey, everybody. I like that nice SendGrid open, beautiful graphics. And hey, what a great service. SendGrid is the industry leader in the delivery of transactional emails. And they were kind enough, generous enough to support other startup companies by saying, let's do a startup of the week. Let's do a show where you feature somebody who maybe isn't in year five of the company, but is maybe in month five instead of year five. And maybe we can create a platform for new companies that are coming out to sort of get a little bit of exposure. Maybe they meet an angel investor on the program. Maybe they meet an employee on the program, a partner. Who knows? Uh, but you guys, as the audience, you guys get to hear from a, a startup that's, let's say, under a year old, maybe trending on uh, AngelList, maybe on Kickstarter, something brand new. And um, I really appreciate my friends at SendGrid, S-E-N-D, G-R-I-D, SendGrid, uh, for making this uh, possible. And, you know, it's an interesting thing because SendGrid is an awesome service that most startups are going to wind up using. Why? Most startups have transactional emails. What are transactional emails? That's the email you get like, hey, confirm your email subscription, confirm your sign-up. Uh, somebody added you as a friend in the system. Oh, here's your monthly report, your weekly report, your instant report, your daily report, all of those important things. And they provide all this through an API to customers like Foursquare, Pinterest, StumbleUpon, and Pandora. Those are some of the biggest and most successful names in the business. Pinterest, can you imagine? Hey, somebody added something to a board. Somebody uh, added you as a friend. They're sending. They must be sending millions, tens of millions of these emails a day or week. Who knows? It might be hundreds of millions. Pinterest is a very big company. Foursquare is a very big company. They have hundreds of employees. Why aren't they doing it themselves? Because they're not the experts on it. And why would you waste your time putting five developers and two project managers on email sending when you could use something as elegant and simple as SendGrid? You plug into their API, you send your emails to that, and it's like you're guaranteed to get in people's inbox and not get dumped into that spam filter, which is death for a startup company. Can you imagine if your Pinterest or Foursquare or Pandora emails we're going into your spam folder. It's a disaster when that happens, and SendGrid is going to save you from that disaster, and it's so affordable. Um, 200 emails per day for free, so you can just start playing with it immediately when you're doing your minimal viable product. Go to SendGrid.com. And uh, even if you're not using SendGrid, if you get a val any value out of this program, I mean, we have a lot of people here, five, six people working on this program, trying to make something great for you guys, the entrepreneurs in the audience, the fans of these products. If you're not going to buy the product, just say thank you to them. I mean, it's like the least we can do is thank them on Twitter or Facebook. So go ahead and say thank you at SendGrid or Google Plus, you know, or Orkit or Friendster or any of those things. On the program today uh, is the founder of Zing Checkout. His name is Nate Stewart. Nate, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, nice to meet you, Nate. Welcome to the program. Tell us, what is Zing Checkout? Uh, our big vision is we want to redefine retail. Uh, so that means a lot of things. At its base, we're a web-based point of sale that's built with HTML5 that runs on any device you want to use it on. Okay, and I'm doing that right now. Here we are on my iPad, if my guys were paying attention. Thank you, guys. Uh, and I'm adding an item to my order. And you know, immediately when I look at this, I go, wow, this is beautiful. And uh, my wife is working in the farmer's market right now, and every other booth has a, hey, we accept Square, and a little pedestal with a with an iPad on it, and my wife actually is using it, and it has a very um, similar, uh, this is sort of like the standard POS interface. Uh, so how is it, I mean, this is the question you're going to get from every single venture capitalist and angel investor, I'm sure, how is this different than Square? Well, yes, we do hear that a lot. Uh, really how it's different is just the flexibility and capability, as well as the fact that, I mean, you can run it on any device. So. If you're at a vendor show, you might only want to use Square. That, that's fine. But as you're growing your business, you really need a platform that's capable in your back office as well as on the floor. So and what's an example of that? You should be able to use yeah. it pretty simply. So what's an example of that? I, I run a business where I'm at the farmer's market, I'm in a restaurant, and I'm taking orders on the phone at my computer? Yeah. So, I mean, really, most of our customers right now, it's a, a standard retail presence. So... Uh, you're going to have, you know, apparel store, and you have a Mac or PC, and that's running Zing Checkout. 
now you're on the go somewhere and you want to run a report and send it to somebody. Mm. Like currently, you can't do that on Square on any device you want. Uh, you know, they have a web backend, but it doesn't do point of sale transactions. It doesn't do inventory. Got it. We do everything across any internet capable device uh, that has a modern browser. So it's, it's a radical difference from what Square is trying to do. And why do you think Square took the, it's going to be, it's got to be an app and it's got to be, you know, a native app. Is that just snobbery on the part of the Silicon Valley elite that we're going to make an app because we can, and we're going to ignore the web? Or is that a strategic decision for them I don't know, to drive people to buy actual iPads and have a, a better user experience. What do you think? You know, I think after dealing with just different problems we've had of, you know, onboarding customers and getting people to understand, you know, where the product is, uh, it, it is a bit easier when you have an app. You know, you go, let's go to the app store, download the app. In terms of consumer adoptance, I think that's a better way to go for, for most companies. Now, we're, we typically, are, our customer is someone that's very savvy. Uh, they're looking for a solution that's fit for their business. And a lot of people, Square just doesn't cut it at a certain level. Now, we have customers that are paying us and also using Square as their payment terminal. It's, hmm. So we don't really, uh, we're, not in, we're not competing against Square on every level. At the base level, yes, we take payments. But... A square is going after, I feel, more of a consumer play, and an app is, is where you want to do that. And so what's different about yours? You said theirs is more consumery or, I guess, very small company, uh, you know, like one, two, three-person company. Wh who are you aiming at? Are you aiming at mid-sized companies, large companies? Yes, and we're aiming at companies with real revenue uh, that have, you know, real problems. They have employees that they want to track. They have, you know, what did I sell at this hour of the day? You know, what are my popular products, things that, and they might have older devices. So you're kind of in a market where Windows XP is still in full effect. Right. So we have to be able to integrate with their current, you know, solutions they already have that may be, you know, receipt printers or barcode scanners, as well as the newer mobile devices that they want to use. So, you know, going into the future, we're going to have more of a mobile presence. I mean, it's going to happen. Uh, that's inevitable. But right now, it's easier for us to get in the door of all, th all these retail establishments if we don't force them into using, you know, an iOS product or something like that. So do you think you can compete with them? I mean, what's it like as a founder? This is your first company. You're 29 years old, uh, based in Austin. What's it like going up against Square, which is, you know, now a multi-billion dollar company with the ability to raise, you know, nine figures, and you're going out raising your angel figure, your angel round, uh, from what I understand. What's that like as an entrepreneur? I mean, do, do, is it just too Herculean a task to convince angel investors to get on board? Is it too, you know, large of a task to get people to join the company as employees? H how do you deal with that pressure of, you know, and it's the same pressure that I'm sure Mark Zuckerberg faced when he started Facebook versus MySpace. How do you deal with that emotionally uh, and as an entrepreneur? Well, I mean, all of us go through an emotional battle, I, I feel, in talking to other founders and seeing other stories just coping with, you know, large incumbents or players that have come out recently. But, you know, really, we have a much bigger vision uh, than, than I feel Square is going after. Square is going after uh, a certain market that doesn't accept credit cards, and it's very simple, clean vision. Uh, what I really want to accomplish is something completely different, and I try to think about that. I try to differentiate what I'm trying to accomplish rather than look at competitors and say, why aren't we doing that? Because yeah. I could say that every moment of every day. And now I want to focus on things we can do well, we can differentiate ourselves, and also react to the customer in a way that our competitors can. I mean, try calling Square. Try calling Intuit. Try really getting some response from those companies. Uh, they're great companies in their own right, but it's not that type of experience you're going to get from them. What about the price difference? I mean, that's going to be one of the first things that venture capitalists or angel investors or even your customers will say, hey, how does this compare on a price basis to something like Square um, or a traditional point of sale system? How does it compare? Well, I mean, we're $49 a month per branch, per location, and that's unlimited devices, uh, which is pretty radically different from the current point of sale market where it's normally per register. And what, what so, do they charge per register per month? What, a, a typical point of sale? Yeah. Uh, it, it ranges, but it can be upwards of, you know, $1,400 all the way up to 3000 and that's not including hardware for certain licenses. It can be pretty, pretty pricey.
wow, so places like The Gap or whoever might be paying $1,500 a register and have five registers there or spending $7,500 a month or $5,000 a month or $10,000 oh, a month? I guarantee you that Gap is paying much, much more per register. It's, it's probably eight to 10 grand per register on these bigger locations. And what, when, they, when you come in and you try to get a bigger location to uh, you know, adopt this payment system, what do they say when you say $49 per location? They, do they say, like, how can you possibly make a business? And this makes us scared that you're not going to be able to pick up the phone because if you take one phone call, now you're losing money per location. How do you deal with that objection? Do you yeah, get that we, objection? We get that. We get the fact that uh, you, know, you guys are a smaller company. Uh, but really, I mean, we have a free trial. So just like Square, I mean, you can start using Zing Checkout right away, and you get up to 200 product or 50 products and 200 transactions, uh, cash transactions a month. So they try it out, and when they email us, we respond. When they call, we're there. Uh, you know, we listen to our customers, and that will convert most people. Now, if you want a Fortune 500 company, then you probably shouldn't look at a startup. And we're pretty transparent with, look, we're going to try our best every single day. But if that's really what matters to you, we don't think you're going to get the type of experience you can get from us. But, you know, it's your decision in the end. Yeah. And how important is reporting in, in, in all of this? I mean, I, I noticed that's the first place a lot of uh, people go, like when my wife is doing her books at her smoothie stand at the Brentwood Farmer's Market, give smoothies, a little plug there on Sundays in Brentwood. Um, you know, the first thing I do is I come to the register and I look at, hey, how are we doing? What's the reporting? And some beautiful, elegant reporting in Square. How important is reporting in all of this? And, and how hard is it to do reporting in the traditional POS systems? Uh, well, traditional, uh, I'll give Square, you know, thumbs up for, for what they're trying to do. Uh, you know, we're actually trying to convert to the same charting library that Square is working on yeah. uh, in, in the future. And I love what they're doing. Typical point of sales don't have good reporting. They have... Uh, they have lots of reports, and you look in the back end, and you're seeing a hundred different types of reports, but not really ones that you just typically want to run your business on. Right. Uh, so we try to limit it to just you know product reports, hourly sales, profit margins, uh, things that are really easy to access and you want to access every day. Uh, so you guys are in Austin now. You started in Los Angeles. Uh, you seem to be going further and further away from the valley. What's the vinking there? Uh, you know, it, it's. I wouldn't say that. I mean, I'll, I'll probably be taking a trip up to the valley uh, later this month. Yeah. Um, we, I, I love SF. I love LA. Austin is a different kind of place. I mean, you've been here for South by, yeah. uh, you know, probably. And when it's not South by, there's a culture of things are happening here and you can be part of a community. Hmm. Uh, it's different from a bigger city like LA or SF where, or, or at least into a bigger tech scene where it, it's harder to number one get to places and and also just have that community yeah. so I, I love our, our friends in la and, and our first two investors came from la and sf respectively so it's it's just a different type of way to build a company and we want to build a sustainable company where you know we we're going to need support representatives we're going to need a good amount of engineers uh, we want them to have a good lifestyle and we think that can happen in austin and you think it can happen in the Valley. It's getting just too competitive in terms of housing prices, getting too competitive in terms of just life, traffic, et cetera. And in Austin, you can own a nice home for a half million dollars, a great home for a half million dollars, I'm assuming. Uh, you, can have, you can have a home on the lake for under $400,000. I mean, it's, yeah. it's radically different. Uh, you know, my wife loves horses. I can never afford a horse in, in the next couple of years probably with, with an SF, I literally need to, to just exit for you know five hundred million dollars. It just yeah. doesn't seem uh, like something that could happen. But uh, in in Austin, yeah, it's it's more when I think about it for the employees and the, you know other founders and, and people that I'm bringing on. Uh, I can take the heat, but I want people that are putting in effort to have something worthwhile uh, to get out of it. I see 176 followers on. Um... Angel list and uh, a lot of positive comments and people taking a look at it. Uh, Nolan Bushnell uh, as an advisor. Uh, how has the angel list process been for you guys? Also, John Ferrara, um, who's a great guy at Nimble, which I'm uh, an investor in. Um, how? Let's start with angel list. How has angel list been uh, as a conduit for raising uh, your angel round and meeting uh, angels? 
you know, we're we're uh, we're just getting into to doing our our you know really decent size angel round. We've only taken 50k so far. Mm -hmm. uh, we really wanted to stay as lean as possible. But angel list number one is great just in terms of keeping the scope of your your industry. So I use it to see are there any other startups that are popping up in our industry, uh, which which does happen, and and also to network just generally with people that are interested in what you're doing. So it's great for that. Now I fully expect when uh, you know we get into uh, a little bit bigger angel round that that angel list is going to be invaluable. I mean I I love it. Yeah, uh, and uh, Nolan Bushnell and uh, John Ferrara as uh, advisors here in Los Angeles. How does a uh, twenty-nine-year-old first-time entrepreneur land such high-end advisors? Yeah, I, I believe John's just a reference, but but we you have oh. a friend. Yeah, but uh, but he did see the, the he saw the product at South by and and loved it. Uh, really, it, it's you just have to work it. I mean. <laughs> It's, I wish there was a secret sauce. But well, how do you get in touch with someone like to... Nolan Bushnell? Obviously, he is the founder of uh, Atari and Chuck E. Cheese and um, hired Steve Jobs back in the day. How do you get Nolan Bushnell, a legend, how do you even get in touch with him? Did one of your friends uh, you know, go to school with his son or something? How, how do you even make that contact? Did you email him blind? Give us the, the goods. Yeah, I mean, Nolan came about through just networking through different events and bumping in, as someone said, uh, you know, at one event, we heard that Nolan had U-Wink, which was, uh, if, if you know, a kind of a point-of-sale hospitality uh, restaurant startup he had. And yes, uh, he's it was interested like in our space. A Chuck E. So Cheese for adults. Just, you know, found his email, contacted him. Just a cold email a and said, this is what we're doing? Yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't just one email. I mean, he is a very, very busy guy. But, uh, you know, we try to be concise and just let him know that, you know, we we know his history. We think he'd be valuable to us, and if he sees that, uh, let's let's meet up. And and it happened pretty quickly after the first meeting. What is the business deal for first-time entrepreneurs who are listening? With let's leave Nolan out of the conversation, but generally with an advisor, how do you land a high-end advisor? What kind of deal do you make with them? You give them a certain amount of equity, a point, a half a point, two points, ten points. How does it work? Uh, typically. I mean, a, a point or two, depending on on their value, yeah. um, and 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 not just value, but in terms of experience, how much they want to put in. Uh, if someone came in and said, "All right, look, I love you guys. I want to lend my name, and but I don't want to do anything else." That's fine if they're if they're you know a big name. They get maybe half a point, you know, yeah. if it's really going to to further us. But uh, you know, everyone we brought on, we has a certain purpose as an advisor, and. And that, that's when I think you can give a you know, point or two uh, to them to, to, to make it worth it because they, they need that. <laughs> they need to have some skin in the game in order to make it uh, worthwhile for them to pay attention, I think is probably what you're getting at there. And a point or two is pretty high, but if you think about them getting diluted by half that amount over the life of the company, uh, raising two or three rounds and losing 20 30% each time, yeah, they'll probably wind up with a half a point or a point at the point of sale. And if the company was, no pun intended, um, if the company did become worth 50 or $100 million, then Nolan Bushnell makes a million dollars or $500,000. It is a lot of money, but for somebody in his scale, it's probably not all that much, but it's enough for them to pay attention. So I do think that's probably about right. Um, so Yeah, uh, and we actually, I mean, just for, for yeah. other people out there, we actually re-upped one of our advisors that came on really early on. Uh, he was deluded, mm -hmm. and you know I, it's my mentality that you have to to make people feel appreciated, and uh, he just was awesome from the get go. So when he was deluded, we we just said, look, we're going to re up you to your original. Yeah. Uh, and so what's next? I mean, I know you guys are, are raising the bigger round. Is it an absolute uh, panic out there with the Facebook and Zynga uh, stocks crashing horribly, and it being August? Is it absolutely? just brutally depressing to be out there raising an angel round right now? Or are people still uh, looking at startups like this and saying, hey, I, wa I want to invest. Um, this looks like a growing market with a smart team. What's your sense of the angel market today? Uh, I feel really good about where we're positioned. Uh, I, I think overall the market, there's been a little bit of downturn in terms of just hearing other founders talk and, and what they're dealing with. I, I feel that if you're earlier stage, uh, you don't have any revenue, don't have any 
any traction, any references, advisors, anything, uh, yeah, you're going to have a little bit harder time. But uh, we, we've worked really hard uh, for coming on like a year and eight months. Uh, and we have some notable people working with. We have a great advisory team. Uh, and w I mean, we're excited about it. So I think it depends on where you are. If you're like us and you have all that, you'll probably be fine. And it seems like your team is um, all engineering or product. Uh, Neil is the CTO, yeah. obviously, and he's, uh, you know, uh, does some, done some high-scale stuff. You've got Michael, um, who is a design engineer, and then yourself, um, you know, uh, working on payments and e-commerce. All three or three of the four people who are working at the company right now are product-based. Is the fourth person a product-based person as well, or are they sales? Yeah, they're they're more sales support. Yeah. Uh, typically, how the company structured is, it, it, I mean, I do the design and development for the most part. Uh, you know, Neil, uh, of course, comes in on uh, product decisions, the CTO, and, and anything that's uh, affected by technology. But really, he's amazing with, you know, the back end infrastructure, security, and we deal with PCI compliance. You need someone on your team that understands just all that the hack the hacker speak and you know yeah. what's what goes on in the routers and i have no idea how that happens but right. i can code yep. things so we each have our different part and and i i, I wouldn't have it any other way and uh, that, uh, I think, gives you a leg up just looking at the commentaries uh, on AngelList and other folks. You, you're a very product-driven team, so people see the product evolving over your discussion with them um, and see it in the workplace, uh, you know, in the client's hands. For $50,000 to build something that is a square competitor, actually works, is pretty phenomenal. I'm guessing that people are impressed with how much you've created with so little investment. Yeah, that's normally... I, if anything I've learned, I should show the product first when I'm in a meeting. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times they hear the market and they know it's a big opportunity, but they think square. Yeah. Uh, they think into it. Now, if I show the product first, that normally opens the door to a little bit more conversation. Yeah. So your advice, if you have the product, lead with the product. And I can't agree more. Uh, you know, if you're an angel investor and you're having a conversation with somebody, the more they show you, uh, that they've done, the easier it is for you to make a decision on if you want to invest. And if they show, if they talk about Square, uh, well, I could talk about Square all day long, and so can anybody. But to actually show yeah. product you've made and how it differentiates from Square, that that's um, that's delivering on the goods. What's next for the company? What's the what's the big struggle right now? Is it raising the A round, or is it getting customers, or is it developing the product? What keeps you up at night? Uh, it, it's really I want to know what kind of growth we're, we're going to have and and have it proven uh, without a doubt. Uh, right now we're having a great deal of growth. We're doubling month over month. Uh, but really, you know, we, we only got out of beta a couple months ago. So this the story is yet to be written. And what we're working on now are bigger deals. So deals with bigger organizations and also distribution partnerships with uh, some of the people that Square can't get to, and those are payment gateways, those are ISOs, those are the people that sell to the merchants. Uh, we want to be the perfect solution for them to continue the, the lead they have, because Square is eating into that, and we're a great solution for them. So we're, we're working on closing several uh, pretty big deals, and, and we'll be releasing more information later this month. We're really excited So you could be the it. front so end. That, that's what I'm focused on. You could be the front end for somebody else, somebody else who doesn't have the time to build a POS, but who does do transactional stuff, a merchant or something like that, a merchant bank. Yeah, so yeah, so we would be, uh, let's say, uh, th there's first data. Uh, yeah. Although although we're not talking to them, yeah. uh, we're talking to you know top some of the top five ISOs out there. And what do you call them? ISOs. They don't typically build what? What do you call them? ISOs. Yeah, uh, independent sales organizations. Got so it. these are people that go out and sell the merchant account. Right. Uh, to people. Uh, so some of these are multi-billion dollar organizations. They're now, the ones they who let your local restaurant take Visa and MasterCard. Yeah, so we would, we go to them and say, look, you're losing ground to Square, and you're building apps yourself. You're, you're you know getting a design house or whatever to build it. But they're really, I mean, let's be honest, they're, they're not up to par. Right. Uh, we've put considerable amount of effort into this. Let's partner up. Uh, we can give you some rev share. And we've had amazing conversations. I mean, the industry really has just taken us with open arms, and, and we're, we're going to go with that. And we feel 
there's an even bigger opportunity for us uh, than mobile payment apps like Square, because uh, really Square's won that in, in a way. So we don't want to be in that space. We yeah. need to be in, in, in a different uh, space than them. So uh, what are this, um, you know, free to paid, getting, giving people 50 items and 200 free transactions, how did you come upon that number? Because it seems to me as somebody who is competing, you might want to do a much higher number and really get the, the people who are, um, you know, using Square or considering Square to, you know, go to your product. How do you, how do you decide on how much free to give in your freemium model? Well, we're working on different ways to do this. So uh, other companies in our space sometimes subsidize that cost. And if you get the merchant account, uh, which we could possibly take a cut of, right. uh, we, we can give them to it for free. Now, the logistics of it work out to where you have to be a little bit larger. So I don't know what your wife does at her stand, but you have to do around fifteen to 20000 a month for mm -hmm. it to make sense uh, for us to do that. Right. So, it's finding out how do you get to that market now with and that's another thing about square is that you think about you know how are they making money on a lot of these accounts and, and the, the answer is they're not making money on all the accounts yeah uh because it's free and then you just pay fees yeah you're, you're paying fees uh right. so so we want we want to build a product people want to pay for uh and that that could be like into you know the 37 signals lingo right. uh, if we build a product we put our blood, sweat, and tears into it, and we're proud of it, you know, business owners will pay for it. And, and we've already proven that people will pay for our product while they're getting Square for free, which I think is pretty amazing. Yeah. Continued success. Uh, Nate Stewart from ZingCheckout.com. Everybody check out ZingCheckout.com. And uh, you can follow Nate at Become Vocal, Become Vocal on Twitter. Uh, and you can find them on AngelList if you are an accredited investor. And if this airs after the SEC works out. There are accredited investor solicitation rules and crowdfunding rules. Who knows? Maybe at some point you'll be able to raise, put a hundred dollars or five hundred dollars or a thousand dollar chip. What do you think of the crowdfunding? If you could do crowdfunding, would you do it right now? Would you take a thousand dollars from each of a thousand people? Uh, you know, I probably wouldn't at this point. I'd, I'd want that to be vetted a little bit more before. before well, I what if it that. was a um, hundred people at ten thousand each? Then it gets interesting. It, it depends yeah. on the value that they bring. But yeah, that's they have a little bit more skin in the game. And yeah. It gets interesting. Interesting. Well, there you have it, folks. Crowdfunding, uh, something that entrepreneurs are definitely interested in, but some concerns there, obviously. Uh, thank you so much to our friends at SendGrid for making this opportunity available. Uh, and if you have a great idea for a startup to have on the SendGrid Startup of the Week, very simple. Email team at thisweekend.com. Team, T-E-A-M at thisweekend.com, uh, and we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Cheers.